Welcome to the Day I Quit podcast. My name is Laurel Staples, and this is the podcast about how to quit your job, follow your passion, and make more money. If you are currently working a job that you're ready to quit to start your own business, or you're looking to make more money with the side business you already have, you have come to the right place. Visit thedayiquit.com to download your free copy of my ebook, Quit Your Job Jumpstart, How to Quickly Make Money with Your Hobby. You will not regret it. Here's the deal. At The Day I Quit, I believe that one of the easiest ways to transition to being self-employed is to ramp up your side business and start making money before you hand in your resignation. Of course, depending on your business, this approach isn't going to work for everyone, but it did work really well for Angela Profit, who's here to chat with me today. Angela started out her career in the healthcare industry after college. She worked for about 10 years in different hospitals and mental units, but was doing her wedding planning business on the side during most of that time. By the time she quit her last job in 2011, she already had a list of clients, a solid staff of employees, and plenty of experience. So when she was put in a situation where she had 24 hours to decide whether or not to quit her job, she knew what the right decision was. In the last few years since she quit, she's really taken her business to a whole new level, and she's here to share with us today about making the leap into being a full-time entrepreneur. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Angela. Angela, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Laurel. Well, it's great to have you here. And if you've listened to a few of the Day I Quit interviews before, everyone out there, you probably have noticed that I like to talk about where entrepreneurs have come from, you know, about what your life looked like when you were still working a nine to five job. So Angela, can you start by sharing what your career path was after college and what your last job looked like before you quit to do your own thing? Yeah, I was involved in the healthcare industry. I went to school with a focus in psychology and really just wanted to help people. I grew up in a very traditional home with my mother and father. My dad worked full time. My mother stayed at home and raised three kids. And I just never really, that just did not appeal to me at all. So, you know, you do it, you go to college, you, it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, well, I love to help people. Maybe I'll be a nurse or I'll go into psychology. And I really never thought outside of those parameters. Um, But I definitely saw other opportunities and I always had two or three jobs. I I love to work ever since I was little. My mom would say I would line things up and really act like I was at work and, and running things. So it's kind of like I feel like I was born an entrepreneur, but it took me 20 something years to figure out I am not the girl who needs to be working for someone else nine to five. <laughs> I hear you on that. Well, tell me about what your career did look like. You know, you get out of college. It sounds like you went into healthcare. What did that look like? I did. I did my internship at a facility in Florida in a great mental health program where I got to experience the lockdown unit, the adolescence unit, which is very sad, and partial unit, meaning the patients were stable enough to go home at night. And I was and, and a therapist. And so my job was to listen to all of the different group therapies that we did and find out what were, what was triggering and, and trying to offer help uh, along working with a psychologist who wrote all of their medications. And what I was realizing as I was learning about all these people, I'm like, wow, I'm a really sheltered person. My parents did a great job of sheltering me because I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, you read about this stuff in college, like, what bipolar means and what schizophrenia means and what manic depressive means. And then you, you know, watch these movies that come out and then you actually work in it and you're like, wow, this stuff really exists. And these people are very sick and they have a very serious problem. And at the end of the day, I cannot help them. And it just felt like this helpless rat race that, that I was just turning. There, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. So there was no gratification, satisfaction, happy, um, time and something significant happened to me where one of my patients had a suicide attempt and she was in the partial unit. So she was transferred and admitted over into the lockdown unit. When I went to visit her, you know, my job was the girl who's like, what, what, why did you do that? What were you feeling? What were you, what, what made you jump? And, um, she looked at me and said, I'm sorry, who are you? 
And, you know, I've been her therapist for almost six months. And so it just, it broke my heart. I'm like, what? How can you not know who I am? I've been helping you. But what I very quickly realized is these people are very sick and I'm not the, the strong person to be in the industry. So I moved home and my parents were a little agitated, like, we paid for you for this education. What are you going to do? Come home and work in a hospital at home. And I mean, again, because it was a really great mental health program. And, you know, I just, I didn't know what I was going to do. I went back to the gym. I taught gymnastics. I did get a job at a local hospital um, working with an infectious disease physician and working with AIDS patients. And, and I liked that, too. Um, and then I would move on later and work on joint commission, which is like preparing 10,000 employees for the hospital police to come and do an inspection to get a score. And that was very stressful. And I wasn't just working 7.30 to 4.30. I was taking all this work home with me. Plus, I still taught gymnastics and was still working 20-hour days for someone else making, you know, very, very little money. And I really loved what I did. But on the side, for fun, I was planning events and weddings Pretty much the whole time I worked at the hospital, it just kind of started out with someone at church saying, hey, can you help me plan this event? Like, I know that you're really, really organized and very creative. My parents are very involved in the Catholic ministry and the Nashville Diocese. And so my mom actually, like, they plan funerals, <laughs> oddly enough. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll help. And then my sister started helping. It was really just kind of for fun. Well, let me stop you right there. Yeah. Let me ask you, it sounded like you, you always wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, I wasn't meant to work for somebody else. Tell me about when you realized that you really weren't on the path that you wanted to be on anymore. Well, it just comes with like morals and values and how you were raised and like, you should treat people like this. You shouldn't do this. And you know, in every industry, there's politics, unfortunately. And so there were things where it's like, I would like for you to say this, but in my head and my heart, I'm like, I don't want to say that. And I don't, you know, I'm a very honest person. And so, you know, not that they were asking me ever to be dishonest. It's just there were, there's always something going on in the background that you just don't feel good about. Um, and that's kind of, what was what was happening some sometimes you know you just don't get that feeling that you're on the same page as your boss or you're on the same page as your coworkers. um it's very much like you have to play a game and just smile and be sweet and pretend like everything is okay when you know that everything may not be okay um you just kind of have to play along like you're definitely not in control because you have to do what you're told <laughs> Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay, so you're in this in this career mm -hmm. that you're just not really feeling you're doing what you're told to do, but it's okay at the time. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds like you get this job planning somebody's wedding. Mm -hmm. So what year was that? Because I know you quit in 2011. So what year did you get that first wedding planning business? Well, over the years, I kept growing and adding people. And um, I, my accountant, I think, one year looked at me and he's like, why are you still working at the hospital? Like, you've got all this wedding business and this event planning business on the side, and you just keep hiring more people to help you. And, you know, if you would really just focus and work on your own business, and you would be fine. And so, of course, you know, my parents are like, well, you never know how many weddings you're going to have in a year. And you never know how many events you're going to have. But, you know, the hospital provides good, stable money and provides benefits and, you know, all all of these great things that is supposed to be like this perfect American dream that you'll have Social Security. And, you know, so I kind of listened to him for a couple of years and just kept adding people to help me and getting busier and busier and something I knew that I wasn't just going to walk in and quit because I'm not like that, but um, it's a security thing. You know, I was living this traditional life that I was grown up like they raised me to do this kind of thing. And then to step out of the box, you know, it's a scary feeling, but I didn't really have time to think about it. And I knew that something was going to drastic have to have to happen to me to make me go in and say, okay, I can't do both jobs anymore. Like people at the hospital, they're like, how do you keep up? Like, cause they would see my website. They would see Facebook started to come out and pe people would post pictures. They're like, how do you have time to plan these big weddings? And then 
work at the hospital, I'm like, oh, it's really easy. Like, I just start work at like 6 a.m. in the morning. And, you know, whenever the doctors need to meet, I meet them. It's really not that big of a deal. And most of my brides needed to meet at night. And so it really wasn't that hard because they worked during the day and then I would work on the weekends. But I was working literally 21, 22 hours, seven days a week for three good years straight. And I just didn't know, like, how to get out. So, um, you know, something had to happen. You said something has to happen. Tell me about the moment that it did happen, about the moment you quit. So I got a phone call from someone saying, so-and-so is planning a wedding and we want you to interview to be her wedding planner and we're going to interview another person and this is actually for a television show. And yeah, I really honestly didn't care. I didn't think anything of it. I just went and interviewed for it. And on the interview, you know, I'm just answering the questions and they start talking about the production schedule and how it's for the next six weeks and I mean, long days. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, these people have no idea that I have a whole nother life and a whole nother real job, as I called it. And I'm like, how am I going to, there's no way I can do both. Like, I'm going to have to choose. There was all this paperwork involved that I had to sign and make all these decisions. And so I, I didn't, I didn't honestly know what would happen. So they interviewed me and someone else and I walked away and they're like, you did great. I know that they loved you. We're going to call you tomorrow. Well, they never called. And three weeks, three weeks went by, three weeks. So I'm in Bowling Green at this huge Indian wedding that I'm doing. And it's on a Saturday night. I get this phone call and I didn't know who it was. I was in the middle of a wedding, so I didn't answer it. And the bride had left me a message and she's like, I, um, can, you know, can you just call me back? I'm sorry. We've been really busy. We're just now getting back to you. So I called her and she's like, you know, I just wanted to thank you for everything that you did for us because we did like this little mini mock wedding pretty much. And she said, I just want to let you know. And she sounded kind of sad. So I thought that she was going to say, you know, we went with the other planner or whatever, which would have been fine. She said, I would not have anyone else plan in my wedding. Like you totally understand my personality. You completely, everything you said, you completely know what I need and what I want. And she's like, we want to hire you and we're going to start filming like tomorrow. (laughs) So I know that, you know, you're busy too, but can you kind of clear your schedule and we can start production and, you know, come in and sign all this paperwork. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, I guess I'm going to have to go in and talk to the hospital and just go in and tell them, you know, maybe I can take a leave of absence and You know, I just I didn't even talk to anybody about it. I just thought I was like, you know what? I think this is God telling me this is your opportunity to jump and like go for it and don't be afraid. And sure, it's scary, but this is for you and your company, which I really didn't even refer to it as a company at the time because it was just something fun that I did. Um, So I did. I went in and talked to my boss and I just said, I really don't know how to tell you this, but um I a really good opportunity came my way that involves some production for a wedding and the schedule is not going to allow me to work both jobs. So I'm going to have to choose. And since this is something that I want to do and I feel that I'm very, very good at, um, I think I'm going to have to like quit. <laughs> so she's like, what? You're going to quit? And I mean, I had all my files and everything very organized. And so there was um, a female that I reported to and then another doctor. And I went in and told him, and he's like, you're really going to quit. You know, and I'm crying. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'll help train somebody. And he threw his arms around me and hugged me. He's like, I'm so proud of you. He's like, I was wondering when the heck you were going to quit. And he's like, the stuff that you do that I see is incredible. And everyone keeps questioning me, like, how is she working two jobs? You know how people, like, talk behind people's back. Like, there's no way that she can <laughs> be doing her real job and this fun job. And it wasn't just a fun job. It, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, so I really didn't have time to really think about it. I just kind of had to do it. What is your timeline for all of this? Like, when did you move back to Nashville? When did you get your first wedding planning client? And then I know you quit your job in 2011. Mm-hmm. So kind of give me give me the timeline of when all this is happening for you. Um, well, I graduated college in 2001. 
and moved back to Nashville 2003, maybe. I'm really bad with time. <laughs> I think okay. five year goes by. I'll see a bride in the grocery store, and she's like, I'll, I'll be, if I'm with someone, I'm like, oh, I did her wedding last year. And she's like, oh, Angel, it's been three years, and I have two kids now. <laughs> like, <laughs> all the time. Um, but, I mean, I pretty much, ever since I moved back, I pretty much did both. Because, um, again, my parents were involved in church. You know, I was expected to go to church every weekend, and helped a few people there. Um, I mean, probably the first two years that I planned, I did it for free just because I, it was fun and it was just something on the side. And then a couple people started saying like, you really should start charging for this. And like my uncle, um, on the Gulf coast of Mississippi, he owned a wedding venue. So in the summers, you know, I would maybe work a little bit like pouring tea or passing out pie to people like in the catering industry, but I never, like was I'm going to grow up and be in the wedding industry or I'm going to grow up and be a planner. I mean, he's extremely talented. I mean, he can make wedding dresses and does flowers and the catering and literally is a one-stop shop. He can do everything. Um, I never really wanted that. Like I would get, I get way too bored. Um, That's something that I have learned about myself that has suited me very well in my industry because I go into a space and I can do 50 events in a year there and make it look totally different all 50 times based on the client's personality and based on what they like and more importantly what they don't like um so I was, i've really been doing do, when people say how long have you been doing this i'm like gosh like going on 11 years now i mean i did my first event 11 years ago um just helping my college friends too that were all getting married and getting engaged and it was more about an organizational thing back then, just being organized, doing the to-do list. But now weddings have turned much more into, like with Pinterest, like putting up a house and taking it down in 24 hours. So it's very different. Um, even each year things change. And I'm glad that I'm on the fast track, though. When people are like, what do you do? I usually, it depends, it depends what situation I'm in, but if I usually don't say I'm a wedding planner because they're like, oh my God, like that movie, like J-Lo, do you wear those headpieces? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we have earpieces when we need to, but it's not like the movie. And it is a lot of work and there's a lot of emotions and I'm very calm and cool and collective and I don't take things personal. And I think all of that has stemmed from me working in mental health. So I didn't know at the time, like, God, why did, why am I working in this environment? But now I know, like, I cannot actually say I know God put me on earth to be a, a planner and specifically weddings. I mean, it's, it's hard to work with all the personalities and keep everybody happy. But at the end of the day, like, I never take it personal because, because people have so much going on in their life and they just need somebody who understands who can take care of them. And educate them so they know where their money's going. <laughs> well, let's talk about how your life has been different mm-hmm. since you quit. I mean, you sound like you were doing this for, uh, you know, you said 11 years. But by the time you'd quit, you'd done it for a while. Oh, yeah. So tell me about the difference between having this business that you're doing on the side, this wedding planning, event planning business on the side, and then going in, taking the plunge, quitting your job at the hospital, Mm -hmm. and just doing it full time, and how that's made a difference for your business Mm -hmm. and for your bottom line and your profitability. It's really just about focus. I mean, the number one thing is I had to hire and pay other people to be doing things that I really could be doing and should have been doing for my clients behind the scenes where I was working this other job. So it definitely has saved me money. And whenever I quit, I met with my whole team of people. I mean, there were a lot of us, 12 of us. And I told them, I said, I now am going to focus on this, which means I'm going to be more involved. Um, I think some of them saw that as a threat, like, oh, so you're going to be working more. So you're going to be basically taking away money from us. You know, I did not get this great response that I thought I was going to get because I told him I'm going to be more involved. I'm going to be taking on more of the work. So, yeah, I guess in their eyes, I by me being more involved, I wasn't going to be paying them to do as much. But everyone that worked with me at the time had, like, a real job. So it's not like I was putting anybody out without a job or anything. But, I mean, we did have a lot going on. And so I struggled with that. And I, I had a mentor through SCORE 
helped me. I got an advisor through Northwestern Mutual to try to help me transfer, like, all my funds over. You know, you had to deal with all that crap that the hospital kind of dealt with. And it's like, okay, well, I have to do all these things on my own now because I'm going to own my own business. And then figuring out, like, insurance-wise, like, what makes sense. Um, for my business insurance and for health care insurance and, you know, what am I going to do with all of those things? So there was a lot to really think about, but I just kind of did it as it came at me. And my business advisor, I said, you know, I had this meeting, this dinner with my team that, that I work with on the weekends, and it didn't seem like they were happy for me at all. Like they seemed kind of mad. And he's like, fire every one of them and start over because they don't <laughs> respect you. And... There's also jealousy, and I'm like, what? Like, I'm, I've been training these people for years because also I had an internship program because I had girls start emailing me saying, can I eat? Can I follow you? Can I shadow you? I'm like, why would they want to do that? And then I started to see, like, oh, people are obsessed with weddings. <laughs> no wonder. Um, but it's not what you see on TV, and it's not what it's cracked up to be. I mean, it can be a great experience, but it's so much work. And, you know, that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is running a business and managing people and managing expectations. And, I mean, I have definitely learned the hard way on some things. Like, you know, you go, I would go to these networking meetings. And that's another thing that I did that really helped me get out there. I joined some professional organizations um, that were national. So I started to meet other planners in the industry and other vendors. And that really helped get my name out there just by me being involved in the networking organizations. But I keep hearing like, you know, have a policy manual and have a dress code. And, and, I was, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, why would I need to do that? Like the girls know to wear all black and it, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, but then I started to get a couple new interns and I really started to focus and work directly. I mean, 40 hours a week is what they're supposed to work. It's like a full-time job. And I didn't have, that time to give to them when I was working at the hospital. They only worked with me at night and on the weekends. So when I really started to help develop another person, I really got to know some of these people. And I'm like, wow, they've never had any positive guidance in their life. And they don't know how to act. And they don't know how to dress. And they don't know what's appropriate. And so I had to come up with a policy manual. And because I had girls coming to meetings that smelled like alcohol and I had girls going out after some of my events downtown with my logo on their shirt while they're getting trashed and you know it's like I just did these are like to me common sense things that like my parents raised me like you don't do those kinds of things (laughs) um but it just it's shocking to me how the generations like as I'm getting older and gain more experience these poor girls some of these poor girls that you know, think that life is oh so great and glamorous, you know, doing being a wedding planner. It's like, wow, you need to really learn about life first. Like, aside from, like, being a planner, I take care of people every day. And you need to learn how to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. Um, so I, I, it really changed for me, too, being able to see how other people needed hands-on guidance. Instead of just, oh, show up on the weekends and help me put this event together because they didn't see the Monday through Friday behind the scenes of all the emailing and the phone calls and the budgets and the meeting. You know, there's so much preparation to get to the end of this big party, which is what people see on TV. Um, it's it's really sad. So it me being able to focus on my job, um, me wanting to do more of the work and still be able to grow my company, but really focus more on full, a full service planner instead of just being like, oh, I'll do your timeline, coordinate your vendors, and show up to make sure everything's okay. I worked more into becoming a creative stylist, and I started to educate other people. I started speaking at other schools. I started traveling to other states and other countries, and you know, I would have never, ever, ever been able to do that had I was still working my other job. And, you know, it, one phone call literally, cha- I mean, I've had so many phone calls change my life. It's like I never know what phone call is going to come the next day or who I'm going to meet in the airport. Or, you know, I, it sounds so cheesy, but it's like sometimes you just 
have to have faith in God and say, okay, I'm not in control because I was that girl who had my life planned out and I wrote it all down in my tiny little planner. And I'm like, I'm going to get married for five years. I'm going to have a big house and a girl and a boy and two dogs and drive a Range Rover and my life's going to be perfect. And then I quickly came to the realization of like, okay, this is not real life. This is what they call the American dream. But this, I need to start doing what I enjoy doing and spending my time on what I want to do with my life. And I love helping people plan their weddings. I love developing people who want to be in this industry or who think they want to be in this industry. Um, because all through college, I had great opportunities through internships and practicums. And that's what made me into who I am today. And what would you say to someone you talked about helping people and interns who want to want to be in your industry? You know, a lot of people have doubts when they're going into an industry that's kind of well saturated. So in other words, you know, if there are already 50 wedding planners in your city, you know, how are you going to sustain your own wedding planning business? So what have you done in your business to one market it and two really stand out from the crowd and have that flow of clients coming in? Well, honestly, Because I didn't start this company going into it, it's okay, this is my bread and butter, I have to have a marketing plan, I have to do this, I have to do that. I mean, honestly, I and this is in every industry, there is a major problem with follow-up and communication and follow-through. And those were three things that I have mastered. I was just born like that. You either are born with the organizational skill of communication or you're not. It's not – I – I don't feel like it's you can work with people and try to help them become a better communicator. And but it's like there's something in your brain. It's a switch that just it's called being proactive. And I learned very early in this industry, like, gosh, the people have so much on their plates and they're so stressed out and overwhelmed with business that they just they don't keep a good to do list and they don't follow up and they don't follow through. And they say they're going to do this and that and they don't. And then these brides remember everything that you say that you're going to do and for me like that wasn't a hard thing I'm like if I write everything down and I do exactly what I say I'm going to do or more and exceed the expectation then it shouldn't be that hard and so I mean just how I stood out is yes there's a lot of wedding planners in Nashville and but what I didn't do was I didn't go to school for this I didn't read a book there is no book that you can read on how to be a wedding planner it's like you to be a doctor, you go to school for years and years to become that, you know, an MD. There's no real schooling that you can go to. It's all about experience. And so I think you need to write that book on wedding planning. Well, <laughs> I'm working on it and I've worked on it for three years now. And I keep telling myself like, okay, at the end of this year, I got to finish it. But I'm so busy, like, taking care of other people and planning their events. It's very hard to sit down and take the time because, it's all, you know, I've got hundreds of emails and floor plans, and there's just so much to always do. So I hopefully at the end of the year will finish the book, but I definitely already have an outline and, and how it's going to go. And, you know, this this industry is definitely for you either – are born to work in the service industry and you actually enjoy taking care of people or you're not born to service people. And so with all, I love, I love having interns and I love teaching because I'm big on personality tests. I mean, obviously because of my background being psychology, but there's some very simple, fun personality testing before I ever will interview interns that they have to take. And I have to make sure that their personality and their brain works in a very specific way to even be part of of what we do. And, And I'm very different in that because of my background in psychology, I see things from a different angle from probably, I mean, there's a lot of great planners around. They, they're organized, they're creative, But, again, having the creativity, the communication, being able to execute, being able to stay calm, um, it's hard sometimes. But, again, going back to my past and working in mental health and knowing how sick some of those patients were and me thinking that my life is hard sometimes is a joke compared to what I look back where I worked 10 or 12 years ago. And I'm like, my life is wonderful, and I'm so blessed to have what I have 
and I'm so blessed to have awesome clients, but that didn't come overnight, and it didn't come without a lot of hard work, sleepless nights. Um, you know, it was just I'm very driven to, I just want to make people happy, and so if, you know, at the end of the night when the parents are happy and the bride and the groom are happy and the guests, the guests had a great time, like, you know, that's, you can't pay for that gratification. You can't go to school and get a degree. You know, I don't really need a degree for what I do. However, I would say it's the best thing I ever did to go to college and have all those experiences and working in those internships for free because it taught me how to handle and deal with a lot of different type of people. And there's not many wedding planners that in the industry as a whole that have that background. Um, so that definitely has set me apart from anyone in Nashville, just because they've never had that hands-on experience before. Um, and plus, like my brain, I, because I get bored so easy, my brain is just kind of all over the place. So I play off of other people's excitement. So when girls come in, I mean, now it's so easy. I look at their Pinterest board before I ever even meet them, and I can very quickly look and see um, commonalities of like, okay, every bouquet is round, every cake is round, every table is round, every, you know, so I, I would never say, hey, do you want square tables? <laughs> so it's kind of like I know what these people want just by looking at their patterns before I ever even meet them. And so that's why they're, they're like, oh, my gosh, you know exactly what I want. Well, my, the psychology part of me, that's how I think. So, like, for example, I had a girl one day, we were shopping all day, and we were looking at linens and flowers, and at the end of the day, she's looking at all these cloths, and she's like, you know, I just don't like any of these. I mean, I have books and books and books and books of fabric and linens, and I looked at her, and I said, do you have curtains in your house? And she's like, what? I'm like, do you have curtains in your house? She's like, no, actually, I don't. I don't even have blinds. I'm like, and as far as like on all your beds, like your bed spreads and everything, everything you have is probably very thin and very simple. It doesn't have a lot of texture. And she's like, no, it doesn't. I'm like, you don't like fabric. You don't like fabric. And you know what? It's okay because there's glass tables, there's wood tables, there's acrylic tables. We don't have to use linens in your wedding just because your friends do it or that's all you see on Pinterest or wherever you're looking, it doesn't mean that we have to do it if you don't like it. And she's like, oh, my gosh, this makes me so much happier. She's like, can you show me some glass tables? (laughs) You know, so it's like they feel like, oh, my God, how do you know what I want? But a lot of it is just psychology and knowing traits and knowing patterns in people. Well, I love that. I love that you're using your skills and the things that you've learned along the way and your training and your schooling and your jobs to really bring it into your own business. Mm-hmm. And I want to I wanna hit on, before we have to go here, I want to hit on the marketing part of it because you've told me about how you stand out from the crowd, you know, how you're really making a, a name for yourself out there. But what do you do to get more clients, mm-hmm. to get that going? What's What would you say just has been the one most successful, effective thing you've done to market yourself and your business? Just um, the most effective thing is word of mouth. I mean, I don't really advertise. I've never been that girl that has to strategically sit down and say, okay, to get this many weddings, we have to do this. Um, You know, I will say just, again, doing exactly what I say I'm going to do and and people, I earn people's trust. And so when their friends getting married or their mom's friends, daughters getting married, they're like, oh, my gosh, this girl totally took care of us. You have to call her. So that's how I get my clients. When I get when someone fills out my contact form online and it says, how did you hear about us? They're like online. Nine times out of ten, they're not going to hire me because they're just calling around price shopping. And when people call me and the first thing they say is, how much do you cost? I'm like, I'm not your girl because I provide a service and a product and, and an experience. And it is like no other experience you will have in planning your wedding. And I'm very, very um, confident in that because I've done thousands of events now where people tell me that they're, they don't understand how in the world they would have made it without m- what I offer. And so just by doing a good job, the word of mouth has served me very well. Um, something else that I did was I'm part of a international magazine only because I wanted to do destination weddings as well. And so being in an international high-end bridal magazine 
Like you have an ad in mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Well, okay. it's not an ad. Um, it's a platinum membership. So like you, you have okay. to be invited. You have to have, you know, so many credentials or mm-hmm. so many events and have like a real company. Because the thing with wedding planning is like you don't have to have a business license. You don't have to have insurance. You don't have to pay taxes. You, you don't, ha- you can do this totally under the table and c- put up a cute website. But like, if you're going to have a business, like do it the right way and like make sure that you're covered with insurance and make sure that you know what the risks are. Because when you're dealing with people's money and a lot of it when with a wedding and they, these parents have saved all their life for their kid's wedding. And if something goes wrong or if something happens and you're the planner, I mean, you have to be prepared. Like I've had to go to court before, not because of something I did, but I've been subpoenaed for other things that just didn't work out for people. And I'm like, gosh, thank God that I have like a really good business advisor and a great attorney that can review contracts for me and a, a great mentor through SCORE. Um, and then being part of the EO program as well like it's just been amazing and incredible to meet all these other entrepreneurs and none of them are involved in the wedding industry per se they just think before they got to know me they're like oh you're just the girl that plans pretty parties and I'm like "Eh, it's a lot more than that Um, because I also through the EO Center too I want to help share what the EO Center is because not everyone knows what that is so the EO Center is the entrepreneur organization and I was involved in the catalyst class last year um, that is they take about 25 people a year and you go through this class with an incredible leader who's been a wonderful entrepreneur for our city and um, teaches at some of the local schools as well. He he basically just goes through and tells, you know, some business practices and ethics. And, you know, yeah, we can go and read the book, but it's you don't get the same kind of feeling as you do when you're sitting in a room with 25 other people who deal with the exact same things that you deal with, but in different industries, and to have people that you can bounce ideas off of. So that class was great. I learned a lot. Um, and then now I'm in a forum group through uh, the entrepreneur organization that I think there's like 12 of us. And there's these forum groups. I, I recently found out like it's a major organization. It's all around the world. And w- when you own your own business, then it's like everybody kind of knows what the EO program is. It's like, oh, are you in the entrepreneur organization? And a friend of mine who owned his own business, he's like, you've got to, I know you don't have a lot of time, Angela, but you've got to take the time for yourself and for your company and take two hours every other week and go to these classes because I really think it'll help you be a better leader. It'll be a better, on help me be a better entrepreneur. Like I want to have a book and I want to have product and um, I teach a live stream series on technology and teach other planners and other small businesses like hey, going paperless really isn't that bad. Like you all have iPhones and iPads. Why aren't you using all this free technology to back up everything in your company so that you never have to worry if a flood comes along and all of your clients' folders float away in the flood? Like that happened to vendors that I worked with, and I developed this class to help them learn how to sync up all their technology and get everything and use iCloud and I mean, it's just helped the business grow and me form this team of vendors who know exactly how my brain works. So they know what the expectation is. They know that I'm completely paperless. Um, you know, so I've, I've been able to develop into doing other things, not just plan parties, but to help other small businesses like, hey, I know that it's hard, but like if you take it one day at a time and you start implementing an app or two or technology here and there, like not only are you going to save money and overhead in your company, but you're going to probably build a better rapport with your team just by setting the standard. Like, for example, you know, my my team, they've got company credit cards. So when they go out to lunch, you know, they have to bring me their receipt. And then if they didn't use, if they use their personal card, then I have to, um, they have to fill out a form and then they, then they get their check, but that I have to sign it first. And what if I'm out of town? It's just, you know, gosh, set up something in an app where every one of your employees take a picture, all the receipts funnel to one folder and then the accountant cashes it out every um, or balances it once a month. You know, there's just all these little 
itty bitty little things of taking a picture of a receipt when you leave somewhere that can save you so much time when it comes to do with taxes. And I just, some entrepreneurs, I'm like, gosh, if you would just look at how much money you're spending on ink and copiers and paper and how many trees you're killing and, oh my gosh, like it's really not hard to implement. I mean, I'm just appalled at the way some people run their company because they are so afraid of change. And so I've gotten the opportunity to work with some people in helping them use Dropbox and helping them use Google Drive and teaching them hands-on, like, how to move all their client files older, over and how to back things up to iCloud. And that's been a very rewarding thing for me. So, you know, someone comes to me and says, my house burned down last night. And, like, I'm not kidding. Someone says to me, um, you know, all my hard drives, everything was backed up. But if I didn't have things backed up in Dropbox or in Google Drive, like, I would have lost everything. So, like, when people have life experiences like that and you know that you're helping them build their business and change their life, like, you just want to keep going. And you just want to, you know, tell everybody, like, hey, you got to go paperless. you got to do, you got to do this, you got to do that, um, just to help. Because that goes back to your theme of just wanting to help people and help people do better. So on that note, we're out of time today, but I just want to ask you really quickly, you know, what piece of advice, just if you had one piece of advice to give to someone who wanted to quit their job, to start their own business, go out on their own, what would you tell them? I would tell them to jump. And you, I mean, you can all, if you, if for some reason you're not making ends meet, like people ask me, how many weddings do you do in a year? I'm like, I have no idea. I just know that I work a lot, but I love what I do, and there's money there to pay the bills, That, and, and I'm making a lot of people happy. So, you know, if they stop coming, the worst that would happen to me is I go back and get a nine five job that I can always fall back on. So it's like, in Nashville is, I mean, we have a new entrepreneur entrepreneur center opening downtown this month, actually, and there's incredible support in in the town of Nashville with all the creative people. So I would just encourage people to do it and don't like look back, just move forward and know what you know how to do and do it really well and service whatever industry you're servicing and stay focused and knowing what you want. You know, people come to me with all kinds of crazy ideas and sometimes I'll get off track a little bit. I'm like, no, I don't need to be planning funerals, you know, Um, (laughs) but just and some people, they're just not a risk taker. And and I really wasn't either. I thought I was this traditional homegrown child. But in in actuality, I am a risk taker. And I'm much more happy when I take risks. And sometimes they fail and sometimes they're great. But we have to make mistakes to learn from them to make us better. So I would just encourage people to do it because time flies by and time is money. So if you don't start now, um, you, you could be passing by some really great opportunities that you could be getting on instead of wasting your time doing it for someone else. Truer words have never been spoken. <laughs> well, tell us where what your website is, how people can yeah. get in touch with you. My website is my name, Angela Profit. It's two Fs and two Ts dot com. And there's lots of information on there about planning events, um, about the classes and the seminars that I teach, which just are not industry specific. It's really just for any small business owner that wants to make a difference in the technology world and how to implement that. And also work with other small businesses on how to have a better team building atmosphere on doing personality tests and making sure that people understand how other people's brains work. Um, I really enjoy teaching that class as well because a lot of productivity comes out of that when everyone is on the same page. Great. And there's some awesome videos on your site as well that I've watched. And if someone is not planning an event, those videos make you (laughs) want to plan an event with you. So that's exciting as well. Well, Angela, thank you again for being here. It has been so fantastic to chat with you today. Thanks for having me, Laurel. Thanks for joining me on the podcast today. There are a few key points of Angela's story that I want to quickly highlight. And the first is using your life experiences and your current job to help you develop skills that are going to help you grow your business. Angela talked about the main way that she stood out from her competitors, the other people in the wedding planning business, was different 
skills that she had developed as a therapist and with her psychology degree. So she had gotten the ability to read people and understand people's wants and needs and mental state and just get underneath what these brides really want in order to deliver it and to follow through in a timely manner. So a lot of how she was connecting with these brides was through her careers, through what she had learned as a therapist and a psychologist and all of this, through those careers. So take what you're doing now in your current job and see what skills and talents that you can learn currently that are going to help you when you actually take the leap to be a full-time entrepreneur. Because there are always skills you can cultivate at the moment. And Angela would not probably have been successful at her wedding planning business if she had just gotten out of college and immediately started it. She wouldn't have had some of those skills. Second is knowing your value. I loved when Angela said, if a bride calls me and she's the first thing she asks is, what's your price? Then Angela's probably not your girl to do your wedding planning business. And that goes back to knowing your value as an entrepreneur and being able to charge what you're worth. And that doesn't happen overnight. Obviously, Angela had been doing wedding planning for a decade or so to get to the point where she felt confident enough that she delivered On her word, she delivered fantastic, beautiful events and isn't willing to take a lower price for that. So know your value and create that confidence with yourself and with your business. And third, she talked about hiring employees and making her employees and her interns take a personality test before hiring them. This is something that's really huge because employees can make or break your company and you want to get the right employees and the right interns that are going to help you take your business and your vision to the next level. And so if you want to take your employees through some sort of personality test, make sure they have all the information and dress codes and all that that she talked about. That is definitely something that Angela has learned. Sound like she learned the hard way, but has really excelled in once she got a handle on it. So if you want to connect with Angela, check out her website at angelaprofit.com. That's two T's and two F's there. Also follow her on Facebook and watch the videos on her site because one, her videos are great. And two, Videos are an amazing marketing tool for an entrepreneur, especially when you have a service-based business like she does. So watch her videos, see how she does them, see if they get you excited and what gets you excited about them and how you can use that same sort of technique in your own business. I'll also have her info on the show notes for the podcast on my blog. So thanks again for listening in today. As always, there's a lot more info on how to quit your job and start your own successful business on thedayiquit.com. And if you haven't already followed me on Twitter, please go to at dayiquit to connect with me on there. Happy quitting and I'll see you next week.